entrepreneurs and the startup founders. Uh, I just looked at the report yesterday. Now, if you look at UN 2024 funding, the startup funding in India was 5.33 billion and uh, US was 93 billion. Entrepreneurs sometimes commit mistakes or going after every single opportunity and in the process their efficiencies are much lesser. But the lesson that they should learn is that Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Pathfinders, our podcast series from Success Alchemist. Pathfinders talks about the entrepreneurs and business venturists who have navigated through the challenges of business, setting up a business and growing it to the new heights. The idea is to learn from their stories to find out what is it that can inspire other budding businessmen. I'm really happy that today we have Smita with us. Thank you very much, Smita, for sparing time. Thanks for having me. Smita has been in US as well as India, both as a part of a very large corporate and having set up her own business, having managed it internationally and grown it. And at some point in time, she stepped out of that business by IP transfer. And after that, she has spent the last six to seven years in mentoring many other budding startups and also having been part of a few advisory boards. Based out of here in Pune, she is actively involved in the startup circuit and actively works with many types of industry verticals. In what way do you think that the landscape in startups is different in India as compared to US given your extensive experience abroad? Great question. Uh, US is really a mature uh, uh, startup ecosystem. Uh, US became a developed country in late uh, 19th century and we are still in the developing stage um, and we are comparing both. So it's a great uh, story for India. India is the third largest uh, startup ecosystem right now. There are a lot of differences uh, for sure, um, whether culture, the market dynamics, um, the investment uh, ecosystem and the kind of problems people are solving. Um, US, as I said, uh, the, the VC uh, community ex has been existing for a long time. In India, the startup ecosystem is very recent and the kind of challenges India has today is bringing a lot of opportunities to the entrepreneurs and the startup founders. Uh, I just looked at the report yesterday. Now, if you look at Q1 2024 funding, the startup funding in India was 5.33 billion and uh, US was 93 billion. That is almost 20 times. Yes. Um, having said that, if you look at, uh, it's very interesting data that uh, early stage uh, seed funding uh, is at average of 1 million in India and 3.1 in US. The growth stage companies, it's 7 million in India and about 5.5 in US. And for later stage companies, it is 17 culture. In India, we are learning. You, if you see, you will see now the incubators, the accelerators, uh, mentoring programs. Uh, but it it is not as advanced as uh, US. It's in their DNA. We are getting. And when it comes to the policies, government support, I mean, both the countries are doing their part. Uh, some things are working, some things are not working. Yeah. But everybody is pushing their efforts. What a nice articulation because it has given me a full picture of what's the current situation. Experience of setting up a new business in US, was it easy or was it somewhat difficult as it is perceived to be here in India and what were the challenges that you faced at that time? It's very easy there. Um, you know, your accountant can help you or it's, it's a very straightforward process. Uh, not too many complications so it was pretty easy to set up in india certainly uh, though there is a lot of talk about uh, doing uh, ease of doing business mm. um i think we have a little long way to reach now yeah. and how many years after having set up that business in us did you move back to india so i did my i, I did two ventures the first one was in 2006 uh, yeah. and i uh, it was a boutique software development company, uh, which I started in US and I had built a team here in Pune. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a product person. Uh, my heart was at building a product. So the second venture, uh, again, it was, uh, it started in US. And um, when it comes to the product development, launching the products, I think it certainly needs capital uh, because you need money for marketing, sales. Yeah. Um, and if you are a company where there is a lot of R&D, deep tech companies, they need a lot of funding. 
feeling uh, a threat. But a lot of times the challenges are about, uh, do you understand your market? Do you have a, a value proposition defined correctly? Have you identified who's your market? Is the solution you're building, is that really what your customers want? Will they pay for it? I think these are the major problems than the funds. If these are aligned well, I think funding issue gets resolved very quickly. If somebody is not getting funded because the investors are not seeing all these things. So the problems are usually a little different than just the funding. Which means it is necessary for entrepreneurs. There's a lot of change that has also taken place because of the technology advancement. More and more companies are now adopting technology to enhance their efficiency and enhance their reach. At the same time, the reality of the business is that you must be closer to your customers. You must be able to extend to them a personalized experience. So how does this digital experience compensate for the lack of personalized face-to-face -face experience that traditionally a convention companies were able to extend and how are you helping them overcome? So I'll just say that it has been about four years, uh, not uh, six or seven years, uh, medium, right? Mm -hmm. So if you look at SaaS company, uh, it's always uh, do it yourself, purely SaaS company. Yeah. Uh, no doubt the uh, customer interaction happens when you are actually selling that to them if it is a bigger enterprise product or something. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of times uh, like you go online, uh, you swipe your card, you get the subscription and you run with it. Yeah. Unless there is a problem, you don't go and interact, right? So it all such businesses, any case, are completely relying on a digital uh, medium uh, to communicate with the customers. There might be other kinds of businesses where your customer needs that uh, in-person uh, communication, uh, attention. So I think those are different kinds of businesses. But still, I think the world has moved on. They understand that a lot of communication can happen online. A uh, lot of systems actually bring you effective solutions uh, in terms of uh, you know day-to-day -day, uh, transactions, conversations, right? So there are ticketing systems. You don't yeah. need to pick up the phone and talk to somebody. Yes. Right? And those processes are uh, pretty well set. Having said that, I think uh, in-person interactions, one-on-one uh, -on -one discussions, I think uh, it's going to stay. It's not going to go away. And it also depends on what kind of customer you're servicing. Yeah, that is true. So that that if you try to relate to what happened five years ago where the uh, lockdown forced people to stay indoors and everybody right. was quite literally dependent on right. being online and in the process the startups got impacted a lot many of them were shut down but some of them survived so if you were to summarize the reason behind those success stories was it innovation or was it their survival instinct or was it fresh capital infusion or was it something else that helped them stand apart and move on and come out flourishing out of that I think uh, nobody has been able to answer this question very accurately. Yeah. Having said that, I think the businesses which had value for that time period survived really well. The second category survived uh, who could pivot very quickly. They changed their business model or they, they, they changed their uh, delivery mechanism and they were able to survive. Should be the central idea behind the businesses Absolute. and that incremental value is what will lead to a greater customer engagement and essentially a much better top line and, and bottom line. Uh, one of the trends that is emerging is uh, the the pursuit to be a unicorn, to become big in a very short span of time. And it is catching up. It, it caught up as a trend. It has become fashionable now. And most of the budding entrepreneurs are now chasing that tree. How realistic is it for people to continue to think that, that that's the right path for them? Given your extensive experience work, working with those startups who are budding and who are growing, how, how realistic is that? I must say I'm a very old school from that perspective. Uh -huh. I think... Uh... Unicorns, when we talk about, it's more to do with the valuation and not the value. So the businesses will sustain if they focus on the value. If you are chasing valuations, we have seen a lot of uh, companies probably went up to un uh, being unicorns and then you have seen the downturn also. Right. So in short time, your valuations increased. You applied very smartly different methodologies to get that valuation. But that's not a sustainable business, right? I think, uh, you know, basic definition of business would be uh, you bring in, uh, you uh, deliver a value, you get paid for it. And from a 
the entrepreneur is firm about what is the specific exit strategy should the situation demand. What's your view on this? For example, during the first three years of running the business, when you are just about to reach 50 million, your exit strategy is so and so. But after six years or eight years, when you have reached a billion, then your exit strategy is different. So it changes from time to time. Absolutely. Um, I think three years, 50 million is a you know a great story. I would like to be in that business for sure. In Indonesian, <laughs> in Indonesian rupees. <laughs> Uh, no, so um, yes, I guess it's a moving milestone. Also, it's not bad to have an exit strategy. Not every business will uh, be a, a lifetime business. There are um, businesses which are built to solve a specific problem and they fit in really well with the larger uh, solutions and uh, reach their audiences in a much bigger way. So, you know, it certainly makes sense, uh, especially uh, very niche technologies. I think that's how uh, they find their exit. The other way of exiting is the IPO that uh, you look at and not every company can be a publicly listed company or get to IPO stage. Uh, so then there are solutions like M&A. Yeah. Uh, you uh, become part of another organization so you either merge, create something which is much more value to your customer or it gets acquired and gets uh, put into the either the uh, ecosystem of solutions that the company has or the technology that they has uh, they have where it plugs in. So um, each one may have a little different journey and it's not always about what entrepreneurs want. See, there are things which you internally uh, control and manage but then one has to look at the external factors. A lot of times the market it will also drive these decisions whether you want to continue the way your company is uh, going or it makes sense in your current market scenario to be part of another organization yeah. so it, you know, it, it depends on the uh, market conditions it will keep changing all from time Absolutely. to time. Absolutely. Actually, one more question that I wanted to ask you that although it is declining, but the trend still dominates the startup ecosystem that the entrepreneurs or the business ventures, um, those, those owners have a emotional attachment with the business that they have created and they have seen it growing. And because of which the exit strategy sometimes gets influenced because those decisions are not necessarily rational. And if they are not rational, there is a high risk that it's a mistake. What is it that an entrepreneur should do to become what is now, you know, recently coined word called as emotional. You are detached and you are emotional about it. How should people deal with it? See, um, for every entrepreneur, their venture is their baby and they're emotionally uh, attached to it. Uh, so one thing is building something of your own. Uh, is your baby and you love that uh, but you're building a business and which is a completely different scenario yeah. so one has to be very very rational about it you need to make decisions that make sense for the business if you're too much attached to what you have created uh, you may be uh, hurting the business and if the business doesn't exist your baby also doesn't exist so I think one has to be extremely rational about it uh, when you're thinking about your existence there are unlimited startups, but what you can do is uh, what you can help them in a small way and uh, make a difference uh, all, all, you know, along the way. So I think that's how I look at it. So there is nothing which is uh, qualitative, quantitative. You can keep counting and measuring. Mm. And I feel, um, you know, for India, the startup ecosystem is extremely important. Again, going back to the stats, mm. uh, if you look at 2030 vision, we are going to uh, need to create 90 uh, uh, million jobs. And in by 2047, when we are looking at uh, yeah. India being developed country, yeah. 600 million jobs. Yeah. Now, where are they going to come from? They're going to right. come from entrepreneurs. Absolutely. So that's the only way you can uh, support India and the, the whole ecosystem. So we keep doing our uh, bit and little bit uh, to support. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Smita, for having spared your time today. It was really meaningful to get an insight into what's happening in the startup ecosystem here in Pune in particular and generally all around. And most of what you shared with us is going to really enrich our audiences just as the way it enriched me. So here are the three key takeaways for me from this conversation with Smita. The first one is to be very sure of not only what do you want to do, but what do you definitely do not want to do so that you can bring that focus 
focus which is necessary and the second one that i really like is that it's not just about valuation it is about value the incremental value that you create which can make your business sustainable in the long run and the third one as usual which is very close to my heart is to adopt an a demotional approach to your business now look up in thesaurus what is demotional it is a combination of detachment and emotional try and find out and leave a comment if you find it really interesting once again thank you very much smita for having spared time today uh, that brings us to the end of this episode of pathfinders the podcast series from success alchemists we meet again in our next episode and until then keep scaling up